This is a report I'll just mention real briefly. Uh, was inaugurated uh, back in the fall. We were really happy to um, have a, a big public event here, uh, actually for the building next door, uh, to sort of launch the conference that gave us this report. And we're very, very happy to continue our partnership with the Century Foundation and have uh, the folks back here today for the launch of the report. Uh, I'd also like to thank a couple people. Um, uh, Rohan, if you're here, you know, Rohan in the back. Uh, is a former MA student in our uh, program who has been working with the Century Foundation this year and has put a lot of effort into making uh, tonight's event happen, as well as Mariel, who you probably met at, at the back um, as he came in. Uh, just a fantastic uh, crew at the Century Foundation. We're very happy to be working with them. Um, so, uh, so you know, this is actually our last public event of the academic year, and I, I want to thank everyone who's been coming out to the Forking Center events over the course of the year. We've had over 70 of them this year. Uh, it's been a fantastic uh, schedule, and lots of people coming out to every, every uh, event that we've had. So uh, we're really looking forward to taking a nice break for the summer. <laughs> and uh, seeing you all again next year, we're going to have uh, another exciting slate of stuff come uh, September. So without any further ado, I want to uh, pass things off to Thanasis Kambanis. Uh, who is going to introduce our speakers and uh, set our, our report uh, more off for the evening. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Jim, and it's a, a, a particular honor that you were willing to put off your paternity leave by one last day to host this event. Uh, so it's, it's, a, it's a great honor to be here, and we really appreciate the Kevorkian Center's support of our work. Uh, I also wanted to thank Toby Volkman from the Luce Foundation, who's in the audience, whose uh, uh, support made this entire project possible. Uh, the Century Foundation is, is uh, for those of you who don't know, one of the oldest think tanks in the United States. We're celebrating our centennial this year. Uh, so this project launch is one of many events that we have culminating with an October 24th centennial celebration here in New York. So if you're intrigued uh, by the work of the Century Foundation, please go to our website, tcf.org, uh, and consider this an invitation to our centennial. I'd also like to thank our president, Mark Zuckerman, uh, for supporting this work and uh, our sort of deep dive into a question that grew out of uh, a concern that we had as scholars of the Middle East and North Africa, but which also, I think, animated uh, all of our, our interests as, uh, I think, in the case of this panel, citizens of, of the United States uh, and maybe of other countries as well, uh, grappling with the turn, increasing turn towards authoritarianism and the erosion of rights and citizenship, not just in the countries that we study, but in the, the countries uh, in which we live. Uh, the, uh, the work in this project, uh, Citizenship and Its Discontents, follows uh, different, different approaches. Some of them are case studies of uh, specific problems in countries like Kale's work on, uh, on the failures of nationalism in Kurdistan. Uh, other reports in this series look at uh, sort of conceptual questions like uh, Melanie did when she asked what kind of reconciliation uh, is possible and what does political science tell us about this. Uh, we had people look at constitutions, we had people look at um, uh, uh, sort of mining the depths of history and intellectual history to see if that gave us some answers to uh, divisive questions that are holding back the region today. So. Tonight, uh, what I'm going to try and do in, in conversation with these uh, four uh, contributors to the project is ask them to talk a little bit about the research they did for this project, uh, and then I'm going to ask them to extend, uh, extend their thinking into uh, today's policy conundrum and, and today's uh, uh, sort of the, the gaping void that we see when we look ahead at, at the future and ask ourselves what, you know, what is to be done? Uh, and what, if anything, do, does all this work tell us about what, um, what makes sense uh, as a next step? Uh, so to begin, I'm going to turn to Elizabeth Thompson, who's a historian at American University. Uh, she's done a lot of, of pathbreaking work that looks at, um, essentially, at indigenous uh, uh, democratic movements, 
populist movements, revolutionary movements over the last couple of centuries uh, in the Arab world. Uh, and one of the shibboleths she knocks down in her work is this idea that there isn't a, a sort of homegrown uh, constituency for, for democracy or reform in the Arab world. Uh, for this project, uh, she did a really fascinating historical uh, uh, piece of research that, that revives the Constitutional Convention uh, of Damascus in 1922. 1920. 1920, um, uh, in which um, the, the Syrian Islamists and the Syrian liberal Democrats seemed to find a way forward only to be thwarted by a villain that, that she might talk about a little bit. Um, but what I want to ask you, Elizabeth, is um, as you explained to us briefly what, what happened in 1920, I want to ask you whether, the, uh, whether that fork is too far in the past uh, to be instructed today. So if, if Islamists and secularists were able to find this common ground in 1920, have we crossed so many Rubicons since then that the differences are irreconcilable? Mm, interesting. Okay, well, um, thank you for having me here and uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, I wrote about um, uh, hmm, an encounter not no one even looked for it because they assumed from our point of view decades later that this would not have happened. Um, that uh, the leading Islamic reformer of the day, his name was Rashid Ridda, uh, participated in the foundation of a state in 1920 Damascus that disestablished Islam eight years before the secular Turkish Republic did. And yet it was with the full consent through a bargaining process of religious leaders, all right? And so I argue with my Tunisian friends today that this was even more optimistic and more important than the current success since 2011 in Tunisia, where we've seen a democratic transition, but that came through a clash between secular, you know, liberal secularists and Islamists and the secularists won, right? And here we had the actual process over 10 weeks of different parties coming together and bartering. Um, and uh, I'll say two things. One, no, I don't think it's too far uh, uh, gone a uh, hundred years later. I think the important thing is to open people's minds and let them imagine that it's even possible. They have been told for a hundred years that this is impossible, and they have been told that story by those who occupied uh, the Arab world after World War I. And one thing that we often forget um, is that uh, those countries, and not Turkey or Iran, countries that I don't think, are, we, are they, we have, we have them in our project to Turkey, a degree, yes, right? Iran, um, were occupied in the name of the Paris Peace Conference under um, the pretenses of international law and the League of Nations, which was particularly repugnant for um, Democrats in uh, places like Syria, Lebanon, Egypt, and elsewhere. Uh, at that moment. So the international system seemed to be bent on destroying their efforts to democratize. And it's such an interesting case because unlike, and again, I'm a historian, so I think about the context of World War I, right? And we think about politics, say, oh, I don't know, in other empires that fell apart uh, and were defeated in World War I, the Austro-Hungarian or the Russian, where, ru where civil wars broke out, right? Where demagogues took power. Um, and here, uh, instead of seeing a politics hijacked by um, nationalists who, so, who would seek to cleanse the population and homogenize it, uh, we see a movement to bring a variety of peoples together and to restore a kind of liberal constitutional polity. And this terrified the British and the French, who were justifying the occupation of the region uh, by uh, saying, oh, you know, Arabs and Muslims, they're very backward, um, they're fanatical people, they can't rule themselves, we must. And so, you know, um, when I found the letter from the French prime minister ordering his generals to be sure to destroy every trace of the government that Syrians had set up in 1920, um, the pieces of my puzzle came together, all right? The fact that nobody had ever written about it before was because much effort had gone into erasing that story, okay? And, it's, and, and your 
sort of revelatory argument is that it was the French who undid it rather than some kind of exactly. authentic Syrian right. forces. But you also in include in your history some uh, later developments that uh, I don't think they negate your finding, but they may, they cast it in an interesting light, which is that ultimately Rashid Reda moved on into a much more Islamist direction uh, in the decades after the, the, the foiling of this experiment. Well, exactly, but the, but the, the fact that the the possibilities for and the future of democracy was a, a contingent phenomenon not built out of some essential characteristic of islam or arab culture or whatever right that it is a malleable thing and something that can be um uh, uh you know affected one way or the other is is uh, liberating for us today right uh, that means that there is human agency involved um and that we're not doomed i don't know um, you know, I spent years in Damascus teaching English and researching and, you know, people are not taught their own history. They don't know, right? They're taught and they're, they're, their received knowledge is that their only heroes in their countries are military heroes, right? Um, and so to build a political imagination out of this would, on one hand, perhaps um, allow people to think, oh, well, maybe it's possible to be religious, but also see in my religion uh, democratic principles and I can find gra common ground, number one. Number two, though, out of that moment did come structures, right, that, uh, that prevented future moments. And one of them was the rise of Islamist movements um, out of the rejection and repugnance for the international system that was being so hypocritically established at the time. Which means, again, right, once we recognize uh, the external uh, uh, factors that led to the destruction of democracy, we can then begin to think, oh, all right, so what might we do, and we're going to come back to that question, right? Who's Who we? are we? Because we are in the place of those outsiders in 1919 and 1920 um, and who, who wield certain kinds of power, but other things we should not be doing, right? And a major starting point of, of our inquiry was this epochal crisis, right? The, where rights, rights are under threat, where politics and identity groups are, are, are so fragmented. And when we look at anywhere in the, in the, in the Middle East, uh, we, we seem to confront an, an irresolvable cascade of, of crises. And the contemporary history, certainly the post-colonial history, nearly 100 years of history is of fragmentation of polit politically, culturally, economically. Uh, and Melanie Kamet, who is a political scientist at Harvard, uh, has been scouring her discipline for what, uh, what I think what little it says about the, the inverse of that process. So we have a very clear, or at least a very thorough accounting of the processes of fracture and fragmentation. What does political science tell us about the possibilities for unification or broadening identity or uh, one of the concerns that motivate a lot of members of this group, inclusion, more inclusive citizenship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think you're, you're right to say um, that there isn't much evidence, particularly from the empirical record of how you reduce the trend once uh, fragmentation has been set in place. So uh, that's something I've been looking for both empirically and theoretically. So. Um, so we know a fair amount about how identities get primed and politicized and become antagonistic. We know that um, from social psychology, from studies of conflict and so forth. And there's some really excellent work that's come out in the last few years on what people have called sectarianization. That is the creation of sectarian identities in an antagonism with each other. Um, but the question that I think became relevant for this project here is once you have that in motion, how do you dial it back? How do you sort of put the genie back in the bottle once it's been let out? And I think that's a much tougher question. So, um, so, I mean, on the one hand, you have these sort of broad macro historical studies of uh, places where you have 
plural ethnic or religious identities that never exploded in any way. And so why is it that some places uh, erupt in conflict in some times in some places and others don't? And so there's some excellent work that tells us about historical processes of state building that create uh, more unified uh, sort of national political communities and therefore places that could have been more fragmented are not. So you could just take the example of France, for example. There's lots of very important regional identities in France, even to this day. If you travel in Brittany, for example, you see that the trains have, you know, Breton on the on the um, on the sides of them and so forth. Uh, but these are not antagonistic identities. People are not going to pick up their pitchforks and start killing each other because they're from Normandy or Brittany or whatever. Although so they did not long ago. They did, yes. And so there's some excellent work that tells us about the long-term historical processes that bring people together into national politics political communities, and, and this involves things that are not easily manipulated in the short term, like um, building you know, militaries on a national basis, or schooling curricula that inculcate shared civic national values, and so forth. And there's more recent examples of this. There's some work on um, Tanzania, for example, um, you know, contrasting it to the case of Kenya that tells us that in Tanzania you had more unified national identities. Sometimes this comes at a price, of course, um, that it's not so uh, um, uh, peaceful. Um, so there's these long-term historical reasons why we might get uh, a sort of shared conception of citizenship. But for the purposes of this project, it seemed useful to look also at more immediate or shorter term solutions. And so there's two other sort of sets of answers that social scientists have identified that I was looking into in my paper. Uh, one of them has to do with institutions. So what kinds of electoral institutions, for example, are more likely to forge um, sort of integrative societies and reduce conflict and bring down tensions? And there's an enormous quantity of literature on that. The, the question that I and others have raised about this is that, you know, how do you get politicians to agree to those institutions in the first place? So it's not that the institutions magically pop down and appear and then they fix everything. You have to have have a political alignment around an agreement to get at those institutions. And so why, for example, do power sharing institutions come into place in the first place? It's an interesting political question. And so that's maybe another topic we could talk about. Um, uh, and then the final set of answers that I identified here in this project has to do with these kinds of efforts often driven by external actors or NGOs that are focused on peace and reconciliation to try to foster more intergroup tolerance and so forth. So we you know, hear about projects that um, expose you know, randomly selected portions of the population to radio shows about uh, that promote tolerance and so forth. And there's some evidence that these kinds of interventions work uh, at least in terms of maybe not shifting people's attitudes, um, but at least in shifting social norms at the group level so people don't think it's okay or politically correct to say intolerant things about other groups. Uh, and those seem like promising interventions. The problem with those is that they tend to be very micro level and small scale at the community level, so it's hard to think about how you can build a a shared citizenship out of that. You know, so one of the bizarre things about uh, <coughs> people who work on the Middle East, including people in the Middle East, is that they often uh, treat the region as if it's a global anomaly and they don't connect. You know, if they're studying citizenship, they don't connect it. Uh, and not everyone does this. Uh, but there's, it's a relatively new, uh, in my view, welcome development that more and more people are bringing this back into the, the context of just this is one region in the world. And if you're looking at eroded citizenship or if you're looking at reconciliation, Tanzania and Brittany are just as apt examples as, as you know, southern Jordan. Um, but I, I was curious in both in hearing your remarks now and in reading your, your work, uh, what is when it goes the better way, like when, when we're not talking about decay and fragmentation, is it always an incremental slog of, you know, accreted micro interventions that, that, that brings about something better? Or is it sometimes a cascade or, or, or an overnight transformation? Hmm. That's a good question. I mean, my, if, if we're talking about something durable and uh, meaningful, I, I 
I don't have the sense based on empirical examples and on the sort of theoretical efforts uh, to look at this question that there are sort of overnight quick fixes. Um, but there, because there's this, there's this normative bias, which I actually don't think has foundation in, in data that, you know, you can, you can break something like that. You know, you can, you can rip apart the Iraqi state in six months and then it's broken forever, <laughs> you know, and, and maybe that's true, maybe not, but there's not the, the, the converse that, that a Nasser or a Garibaldi or, or whatever structural factor could come in and overnight build state structures, impose institutions, force a collective citizenship and identity that, that people have to hew to by force, and then you actually build a, a more inclusive society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I do think there is room for agency. I mean, the example of, say, Tunisia recently, you could make the argument that there are choices that actors make that build trust and lend themselves more to go down a path towards uh, sort of smooth, uh, not smooth, that, that road actually in Tunisia was not smooth. It was quite <laughs> bumpy at various points, but, um, but at least have allowed for something that looks like a transition to democracy by various definitions. But even then, the, the actors, the agents, have interests that are rooted in more structural factors that have a longer term genesis, like the strength of the labor movement, for example, in Tunisia. You can't just say, you know, there were a bunch of enlightened leaders in Tunisia that decided to bargain with each other, and because of their wise decisions, they ended up in this direction. They were constrained by societal forces that had roots that developed over time. So even that kind of story, I think, has to have a longer term historical uh, aspect to it. So Kale, uh, Kale Sala is at the UN University, and uh, she did a really in incredibly rich and detailed study of um, the, the, the story and unfolding of Kurdish nationalism in Iraqi Kurdistan, um, and um, what she argues are its, its limitations and failures today to speak to the aspirations of, of a new generation of Kurdish youth. Um, and I mean, this is a really, a really fascinating case because on the one hand, it's the success story of a, of a population that was able to generate a compelling story of itself that really wrought major change, transformational change in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, and created Iraqi Kurdistan as we know it today. And then there's this second more depressing chapter that you tell where in the in you know in the era post 91 or 2003 where that story no longer no longer moves people forward and the leadership just keeps telling it over and over um so i i wanted to to know what what your sense of the is the alternative a different kind of nationalism or the alternative not nationalism at all and some other kind of narrative or identity altogether. Yeah, so I think in the Kurdish case, which maybe is a bit particular in this sense, but I don't think the answer is to do away with nationalism. Rather, it's to put Kurdish nationalism in its appropriate historical context, which in the paper we look at, we do take a historical view and we look at various political transitions that have happened in Iraqi Kurdistan and other parts, other Kurdish areas um, over the last hundred years or so. And we try to understand how political transitions between old leaders and new leaders take place. And and what propels the evolution of the political system, institutions, leaders, and renews the political class at key junctures. And what we saw was that at key, at key historical junctures, you had reformists in Kurdistan allying with the middle class and with the younger generation. These would be the two main societal forces that came together to propel a political transition. And it was very important that they didn't do away with Kurdish, Kurdish nationalism, but rather redefined it in line with contemporary realities and in line with the expectations of a changing society. And this is where Iraqi Kurdistan's leaders, we argue, have failed today um, in the sense that Kurdish nationalism has become a tool to preserve the status quo rather than a tool to evolve um, and bring forth a, a political transition towards a new class. Um, so I think in, in the Kurdish case in particular, you it, it must be something where Kurdish nationalism becomes, it, it sort of 
what needs to happen today is moving away from an ethnocentric nationalist narrative, which was appropriate for a certain time when, for instance, with the older generation, as you just mentioned, the 70s and 80s and 90s, were participating in an armed struggle against a repressive regime in Baghdad. Um, those circumstances have changed because the situation in Baghdad right now, the government in Baghdad doesn't pose a military threat towards Iraqi Kurds. So the, the expectations of the younger generation and of people in Kurdistan today are that Kurdish nationalism should provide civic rights, um, institutions that, that treat people equitably, that provide citizenship on the basis of rights rather than benefits on the basis of party affiliation. So you need that evolution and transition of Kurdish nationalism to happen rather than doing away with nationalism itself. And, and when we, we, we started exploring this question of how do you create broader communities, broader identities, more inclusive polities, higher quality citizenship, um, I found myself uh, regularly reverting back to, to, to the term nationalism because it's the sort of default, in, in my understanding, tool in modern times of, of creating uh, bigger, bigger, broader stakes, more inclusive stakes. But nationalism has a really toxic pedigrees. I mean, the, the, the Nazis were nationalists. The Ba'athists were nationalists. Some of the most uh, egregious crimes of the modern era, uh, including genocides, were perpetrated on, on uh, a, a sort of ideological foundation of nationalism. And of course, that's not the nationalism I have in mind when I think about inclusive community building. Uh, but if you are an Iraqi Kurd today, you, well, actually, demographically, I'm not sure this is true anymore. I was going to say, chances are you remember the onfall. Certainly, if you're my age, you do, if you're an oldster. Um, so this is, this is not ancient history. This is people in their 40s lived through an attempted genocide. Uh, and, uh, and so when they're telling a nationalist story, they're also having to distinguish for themselves why this is not like Saddam's nationalism. Uh, and I'm, I'm interested in what your field work taught you or also your own thinking about this. How, how do you tell a story? I mean, because the whole Kurdish trajectory is partly a victory of narrative as a, as a tool of power, right? I mean, the narrative led to a change in power. So what story can you tell about yourself today in Iraq uh, that would forge some kind of, 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 of shared identity between Baghdad and Kurdistan? Yeah, so I think... Um you know, one of the things we do in the paper is we analyze the difference between the two generations. So there's the former generation whose defining political experience was this armed struggle against Baghdad, followed by, in the 90s, building the embryonic um, institutions that became parts of the KRG today. And though that's the generation that went through Anfal. That's the generation that went through various um, forms of repression from Baghdad, but also went through various forms of internal Kurdish rivalry, such as a civil war in the 1990s. The new generation has largely grown up in the post-2003 era. And this is a very different defining political experience. They have grown up in an Iraqi Kurdistan that's already largely autonomous. They don't have many links with their counterparts in, in Arab Iraq. Many of them don't speak Arabic, etc. Um, so this creates an intergenerational tension. And what needs to happen is that, I mean, in our field work, we found it quite interesting that most of the young Kurds that we spoke to, in fact, I would say all of them, told us they were against nationalism. They were against Iraqi Kurd. They were against Kurdish nationalism. They told us they didn't want a state. I mean, really surprising things. They didn't want a separate Kurdish state. They didn't want an independent state. They wanted to be state. part of this an Iraqi multi-ethnic state. We heard such overwhelming rejection of Kurdish nationalism among young Kurds that we interviewed, which was very surprising because actually often people think the young Kurds are, the mo are more nationalist than ever. And it's actually, I think it's not true. They feel very alienated from Kurdish nationalism because nationalism has been the domain of the former generation, which has created it all around, exclusively around this narrative of repression and their portraying themselves as the, the defenders of Kurdistan against an external threat. And that actually, that narrative has been reinforced by the rise of ISIS and by the rise of regional conflicts because this securitization has, has re, or it's been reprioritized in the national debate in Kurdistan and, and the, the old generation of leaders is able to, again, sort of ride on their credentials as having been defenders of, of the Kurdish state. Um, but what you need is a nationalism that evolves and incorporates the, the realities of the younger generation without invalidating the, the history and without invalidating what happened under Saddam. And time and again, what we encounter when, when, when we study these 
uh, these societies. And I, and I think this is reflected also in struggles that, that are happening right now in Western Europe and, and the United States. Uh, majoritarian narratives in which the, the dominant group says, well, we have, an, you know, we have an inclusive ideology. So you talk to an Arab in Baghdad or, or a Muslim in Cairo, and they say, there's nothing exclusionary about my view of Egyptianness or Arabness or, or Iraqiness. And you even, I've, I've heard people explain how, you know, being an Arab nationalist shouldn't make a Kurd feel like they're not a part of it. Uh, and uh, Michael Hanna, my colleague at, at the Century Foundation, uh, produced a very interesting study of the exclusion of Coptic uh, Christians from the Egyptian security services, uh, which is especially important in a, in a state that's a security state and has been for 70 years. So it's, it's essentially a dual exclusion from the most important uh, uh, perch of power. And uh, Michael, I, I want you to talk a little bit about how this, this question that, that we've all been, been touching on and that Kali just started to address directly of uh, an exclusionary narrative. Um, how much of, of being a second-class citizen or being powerless or being unable to, to have rights is, is rooted in a narrative in which you aren't part of uh, some identity story or, or national story? Well, so Elizabeth mentioned the idea that Syrians are taught that their heroes are military heroes. So, um, you know, filling those roles has symbolic import. Um, Melanie spoke about um, constructing institutions, the military being one of them, is one of these pathways to building broader senses of uh, shared national identity. Um, and in, in, in my case study on cops in, in the security sector, you see these things coming together. Um, it is both symbolic power uh, about um, uh, those who are defenders of the homeland, uh, those who are on the front lines, people who are looked up to as national heroes. Um, and in a country, as you mentioned, like Egypt, that since 1952 has either been ruled by, dominated by, or heavily influenced by the military, um, there's a real practical aspect of actual power um, and we see this again now, particularly since 2013, well, even 2011, with the rise of the military, the overthrow of Morsi and a coup in, in July 2013, the military has come center stage again. Um, and despite the kinds of narratives that this regime has tried to uh, peddle about national unity, um, you know, there's this glaring omission at the kind of centers of authority um, that, that both have symbolic uh, uh, import and, and practical uh, effects on, on actual power. Um, and so, you know, what I wanted to do was both explain this very obvious phenomenon, and then this is, this is not, in some ways, it's, it's clear, right? The Supreme Council of the Armed Forces since 2011, when it became a very public institution in Egypt with, uh, with the ouster of Mubarak, there are no Christians on the SCAF uh, since that time. There, are, there just aren't Christians in this pipeline. So um, it's very obvious, and yet because the military is very difficult to study, uh, it is an opaque institution. Um, uh, it, it's, it's understudied in that sense. So I, I wanted to explain both why this has happened, um, and that requires a bit of, um, of a detour into modern Egyptian history about the construction of the military, um, going back to the 19th century, uh, the inclusion of Egyptians even at the conscript level is a fairly recent phenomenon, a late 19th century phenomenon. Uh, and uh, the officer class being Egyptianized is a really a, a late, very late 19th century, early 20th century phenomenon. Um, and so looking at that story, looking at the ways in which uh, Christians weren't uh, included in the officer class of the Egyptian military, uh, when the Egyptian military took power in 1952, uh, the ways in which de facto discrimination against Christians effectively became state policy in those years since. Um, so it tells a fairly compelling story about one aspect of, of uh, this de facto discrimination that cops face across the, the in entirety of the bureaucracy. Well, so is it, is it simply a question of prejudice? Like, you know, 
the majority of Egyptians are Muslims who are racist against non-Muslims, and and if they could overcome this prejudice, the relationship would change. Or is there is there something else in play that's harder to crack uh, that that has to do with with a really either majoritarian or somehow a, 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 a rickety self conception that that is impervious to adaption well i mean part of it is is a historical process uh, whereby citizenship is a new thing right i mean egypt is a new thing the nation state is a new thing there aren't these vessels are not imbued with innate uh, narratives about what that means um you know in in 19th century egypt uh, copts were officially second class citizens uh, the movement toward universal citizenship is halting and f a fairly recent vintage. Um, and uh, the process of constructing Egyptian nationalism leading up to the, the sort of incomplete but uh, um, much eulogized uh, moment of 1919, uh, when the first push against the British happens, um, you know, those are constructed narratives where the question of, of copt sits is an, is an interesting one. Um, and when Christians throughout modern Egyptian history have tried to say, yes, okay, we like that Egyptian narrative about national unity, but um, that but has always been seen as a kind of divisive question. So, um, you know, there is a, there is a, a real uh, history with agency where people have made choices uh, about how they think about fellow citizens, uh, and, and that's impacted the ways in which uh, Copts have been able to integrate into Egyptian society. Uh, and if 1919 sort of is the high water mark of a kind of inclusive uh, Egyptian nationalism, although still one in which citizenship itself is still a contested uh, uh, idea, uh, what we've seen since has been quite problematic. Uh, and what I write about is just one aspect of the ways in which Copts haven't been uh, uh, accorded a kind of full citizenship where they're seen as, as equals of their peers. And citizenship is uh, is by no means a, a fixed uh, concept or a panacea. And Ro Rohan Advani, who is in the audience, wrote uh, a really interesting study of uh, the ways in which citizenship regimes in the Gulf, uh, where a tiny fraction only of the people who live there actually have citizenship, and the rest are essentially second class or, or guest workers. Um, and sort of the pernicious things that happen when you give, through the kafala system, you give individual citizens power over foreign labor, and then they replicate uh, uh, patterns of, of abuse, which the government then uses to control its own citizens. Uh, that's one really interesting constraint, because I would think of citizenship as a as a as a way of addressing this problem but citizenship is just you know citizenship like bureaucracy is just a tool and it can be a tool of of abuse and control and stratification as well as a tool of uh of, of spreading rights uh and we hit a lot against the the problem of identity and rights, if you're trying to extend, basically trying to make better states, right? Better or better places to live with more inclusive rights. Uh, how do you do that? How do you extend universal rights without erasing identity? How do you, for example, say to uh, a Christian who's been discriminated against as a Christian, uh, you know, we're gonna give universal rights, not on a religious or communal basis, but on some other basis, and don't worry, you'll, you'll be taken care of. Or how do you deal with LGBTQ communities who have been not only uh, radically discriminated against in the subject of organized state violence, but then they're often told by rights activists, please sit down and wait your turn, because if we, uh, if we make a case for gay rights now, we're going to alienate the few constituents who support us, and it's much easier to talk about, uh, you know, opposing torture or extending some kind of universal right and not, um, and not bringing up your community because your community is, uh, 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 you know, toxic to, to, to the political world. And this is something that Ahmed Al-Hadi talked about in his, uh, and who's also in the audience, in his contribution to our project. Uh, and I want to turn back to, to, to you all to, uh, to, to talk about this, because I think we, we all struggled with this in different ways. How do you talk about universal rights um, uh, and uh, universalism without 
erasing particularity and identity and, and without um, uh, and without engaging in the sort of pernicious politics of, of, of minority majority politics. Well, so I'll jump in quickly just uh, because the experience has, has been quite interesting and somewhat fresh in Egypt. Uh, in 2011, uh, after the ouster of Mubarak, I think there was a push to talk about universalism, to say, um, you know, we want to talk about rights generally. We don't want to talk about specific communities. We want to talk about securing rights for all Egyptians. Um, and I think there's been some self-reflection in the midst of, um, you know, the catastrophic failures of that uprising uh, by a lot of activists that have now come to say, um, and I've heard this repeatedly, that you know, these things aren't intention. Um, you know, when we're looking at autocratic repression, very ferocious, uh, uh, you know, unprecedented, uh, we can still talk about that. We can still talk about universal rights, uh, but the ways in which repression affects specific communities is different. Um, and there is no reason why we can't have parallel discussions about a state that denies citizenship rights across the board um, to basically all its citizenry, uh, and uh, the ways in which uh, it affects specific communities in particular. Uh, it matters to a Coptic in Egypt that they can't build or renovate a church. It matters that they're discriminated against uh, in terms of uh, advancement within the bureaucracy. Those are just facts. That community happens to be disparately impacted by certain aspects of, of government's behavior and its repression. Uh, and it in no way negates this broader conversation or struggle for uh, citizenship rights more broadly. And I think just conversations I've had with a lot of those who participated in, in 2011, I think sh shows some evolution on the part of many that these things aren't necessarily intention. These things can actually work in parallel. Yeah, um, I, th I think that's uh, really fascinating, um, and it m got me thinking that we're dealing with different political contexts here. So in some cases, we're dealing with uh, countries in the region that have very centralized, repressive, authoritarian regimes, and in other cases, like Lebanon and Iraq in particular, it's a different political dynamic where uh, it's, it's sort of... Um, uh, actually, Roger Owen, the late historian of the Middle East, uh, once described Lebanon as the cannibalization of the of the state by different, um, uh, re essentially sectarian actors, religious actors, and so forth. And um, and so it's a different political dynamic where the struggle for shared rights of citizenship is contested by sort of multiple poles of authority rather than a centralized pole. Um, and uh, and I think the dynamics are somewhat different there because even though you have ostensibly these distinct sectarian groups that have been in conflict with each other and sometimes in some pla in, at some historical moments and not so much in others, um, they all have this shared interest in preserving the system. So, um, so even though they might uh, fight with each other under some circumstances and contest elections ferociously against each other and sometimes pick up arms against each other, they all fundamentally share this interest in preserving a system that categorizes rights by religious or ethnic community. And so it's this, this interesting paradox of sort of fragmentation but shared interest uh, among elites at the center. And so there I think the dynamics are distinct and I don't know if it's appropriate to say more complicated but just different in the sense that you have to um, have mobilization from below um, by actors, by, by sort of non-elites demanding a different kind of political and social order. Uh, but they're up against a very formidable challenge because the elites in their respective communities don't want to change the system and have, are, are profiting and benefiting from it. Um, so, so, and it's very hard when networks of patronage and clientelism are divided along these lines to then have non-elites mobilize collectively on the basis of shared interests um, that are economic or, or on some other basis. Um, it's very and, challenging. And a huge amount, we didn't talk about this much in, in this project, but a huge amount of the money in the region comes from Gulf monarchies that are very opposed to any set of ideas that is about uh, promoting 
Well, I mean, they're divine rule monarchs, right? That, that preside over hereditary kingdoms that have absolute unfettered authority over the mostly non-citizens who live under their control. So not only are they not gonna be big fans of secularism or democracy or pluralism, but they're really not big fans of independent critical discourse at all. And they fund almost everything or their, or their funding is touching almost everything that happens in this region. So that I think is a major uh, factor that's at least as important as the sort of Western and, and colonial interventions uh, against this uh, kind of thing. How, how appropriate is citizenship or rights as a, as a prism for talking about changing these realities, Kale and, and Elizabeth? I mean, I think in the Kurdish case, it's absolutely relevant. And I think what Melanie was saying, it really bears out in the Kurdish case quite quite interestingly in the sense that you have, I mean, maybe I should start at the national level. So, so you were talking about minority rights and how does that sort of, how is that compatible with universalism? In, in Iraq, the sort of failure of the Kurdish elites to engage effectively in Baghdad for various sets of rights has very little to do with the federal arrangement. And this sort of connects with something that another one of our contributors, Fanat Haddad, has written about, which is the, the lack of usefulness, um, or the declining usefulness, I can say, of, of the sectarian frame, um, and the need to look at the intrasect dynamics. And in Kurdistan, this is exactly the issue. So the, the failure of the Kurdish elites to engage in Baghdad for these kinds of rights really has to do with political dysfunction at home and within themselves. Um, and in terms of, of the elites sort of coming together, you also have this in Kurdistan where the establishment parties, even if they do contest elections and they do have their own rivalries, they actually do coordinate to exclude opposition from coming in. And they do coordinate to maintain a narrative that excludes universalism within the nationalist narrative. Yeah. Elizabeth? Well, I think... Uh, <laughs> uh, you all are describing political realities that were created several decades ago when the project of creating a sort of liberal constitutional universalist community um, was thrown out the window, right? I mean, and, uh, uh, it's not for a hundred years really. Have you seen popular movements committed to the sort of uh, the rhetoric of uh, universal and uh, equal rights for all, except for brief moments like 2011, we can see that um, people are opting out. And, and I will just say, it, it, it's not a straight line. As you were speaking, I was thinking of how nationalists came out of middle classes who were chafing against the kind of sectarian and religious leadership that was installed in the Ottoman system of the 19th century, right? The, the, the sort of constitutional movements um, in the 19th century came out of the millets, right? And the reform of the millets and, and people who did not want to live under, you know, the, the clientelism of a bishop of this or a mufti of that and um, sought to break out of it. The, 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 what was there and what seems to be, say, missing in the case of Lebanon was there was an alternative. There was a state up there. And you could say, okay, we should all just be citizens who get our unobstructed direct rights from that state, not mediated by some of these either religious or ethnic or national um, leaders on the local level, right? Um, I think we can see young people in northern Iraq seeing an alternative in Baghdad on, uh, in the same structure that, you know, we could, you know, in the same configuration that we saw in the 19th century, and I feel very optimistic about it. In the case of Lebanon, I just want you to sort of jump in and, and comment on it. There is no, I mean, since mm. 1943, the various mm -hmm. leaders in Lebanon have connived not to have a federal state, if you will. Would, am I reading it wrong in your, in your view? I mean, the structure simply isn't there. Yeah. Or maybe, I was interested, uh, Melanie in her article did talk about the growth of a particular movement, the, um, how do you translate it? The Beirut Medinati, uh, you know, My City. Beirut, Beirut My City. Um, uh, movement, but uh, maybe you could sort of talk about the dynamics of that attempt to break out of sectarianism. And I think it was against it was in face of a, con a, a crisis, right? Yes. Yeah, the, tra yeah. the trash removal crisis. <laughs> yeah. I think it's great. So yeah, pick yeah. up there. Yeah, I mean, this relates to the earlier points we were making about sort of popular mobilization, the role of popular mobilization here. And um, so it is true that there is this, you know, it's a power sharing system uh, in which um, different
different, uh, you know, different uh, religious communities are allocated different, you know, uh, seats and so forth. And this goes throughout the whole system, as I'm sure virtually many people in the audience know. Um, so that already institutionalizes sect. That political choice that happened decades and decades ago already institutionalized sect in the system. Another thing that happened, and, and Lebanon sort of anomalous in the region uh, decades ago at independence, is that this was a more, quote unquote, less a fair political economy with less of a direct state interventionist role than you saw in Egypt or you know virtually every other country in the region, Syria next door and so forth. And, um, and so you don't have as much sort of centralized state power separate from these communities. They are the state. They are effectively controlling it. I mean, I think what's interesting is that it's uh, a little bit more complicated in that there are state resources and these groups are vested in the state. They're profiting from the state. They, I mean, just a concrete example is the state uh, has various social programs that uh, distribute money to say, to pay for hospitalization, let's say for the poor. And it is public money that is paying for 80-something percent of hospitalization charges, but then these religious or sectarian parties will intercede to get a follower a bed in a hospital benefiting from this public money and then credit claim for offering this service. So there's this complicated dynamic where there are there is such a thing as the state in certain sectors and certain policies, but th these um, groups are claiming credit for it. Yet we had, I mean, to get back to your original point, um, there was this garbage crisis in 2015, I believe the Nazis written about this as well, uh, very nicely, um, you know, in which people said, we're fed up with, you know, the, the, la the lack of a solution to the serious sanitation problem. And so uh, folks went out on the street and mobilized and, uh, you know, in this you stink set of protests uh, aimed against political elites, and it was quite dramatic and inspirational, um, but it was also it also invited a counter response, much as we've seen counter reactions to the Arab uprisings more generally in the region, and uh, efforts uh, by elites to sort of shut this down, discredit them, claim that the protesters were a bunch of hooligans. There's some allegations that um, you know that uh, um, plants were you know put in these demonstrations to try to um, whip up violence and make the protesters look bad. But then this it morphed into um, what became Beirut Medinity, this uh, group of activists who formed a list to contest the 2016 municipal elections in Beirut. And they did pretty well, 30 something percent of the vote in Beirut, despite the fact that they faced um, serious opposition by the established sectarian parties, who then proceeded to adopt some of their platform, policy platforms, and try to co-opt them for their own. Um, and, and now um, uh, Thanasi might know better, actually, about the fate of the movement. It strikes me well, that they're in a... Not only do I know better, but <laughs> our group uh, included one of the founders of this movement, yes. Mona yes. Fawaz, who wrote, a, I think, awesome report reflecting on the experience of founding and continuing to lead Beirut Medinity. So you don't have to hear it from me and Melanie. You can hear it directly from Mona on our, on our project page. Um, a common thread, I'm going to say two things and then turn it out over to you for questions from the audience, but a common thread in, in all the things we're talking about is uh, the, the clash between identity and, and sort of civic governance. So there are a whole host of identities that are just not allowed in the public square in, uh, in the Middle East and North Africa. So whether it's Christians not allowed in the security establishment, whether it's, uh, you know, a Sunni can't be prime minister in Iraq or, uh, you know, Arab can't be president, uh, sorry, in Iraq or a, a Sunni can't be prime minister in Lebanon and so on. And you have constitutional or just societally agreed conventions on what category of religion or identity can have certain positions of authority uh, and, and, and what types of people aren't allowed in public to stand up and demand a share of rights. Uh, and, and where it's to the point where in the middle of the most promising days of the Egyptian revolution, uh, a secular activist who was at, at the forefront of the protest would be afraid to say in public that they're secular. 
because that would be political suicide, even in a, in a milieu where everyone around them was also secular. Um, and this sort of, uh, it's like, it's a form of identity politics, I think gone awry, uh, uh, is, is a major constraint on possibility. The other major constraint is fear of the state. So from my vantage point as a Westerner, I'm all, I'm reflexively always saying, oh, the, you know, the state is a great answer. We build up the state, use American aid to blah, 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 blah. And then I talk to Iraqis and they say, the last thing we want is a strong state. The last time we had a strong state, the state tried to kill all kinds of people. And Lebanese will say this sometimes too. They'll say as dysfunctional as our system is, better this than a state that's strong enough to come in and, and start trying to engineer our lives in ways that are always, not just pernicious, but deadly. Uh, and usually, you know, b b b laced with race or ethnicity or, you know, religious bigotry. So better a weak state than a strong state. And that is a real, you know, that's a real, um, uh, I think hard, hard Gordian knot uh, uh, when you look at this. I, I, I spent a couple of years studying Muqtada Sadr's tutelage of, of a Sunni city in Iraq. And this was a, a, it's a fascinating example that's in progress of a authoritarian religious leader who inherited his, his position of authority from his family, uh, who has presided over massive sectarian bloodletting. He does not listen to anybody. He's completely internally undemocratic. And at some point a couple of years ago, he arbitrarily decided to embrace uh, a union with secular communists in Iraqi politics, uh, which has been a winner for him. So now suddenly he is a nationalist secularist and he has very successfully presided over this one case study, one, one place where his Shia militia under his orders has stopped engaging in predatory, corrupt bloodletting. Uh, and they're very popular with the Sunni population that they, they control. Uh, and they've, they've created a storyline, a nationalist somewhat inclusive storyline uh, that that has provided limited grounds for success. And, and I look at this as one of the, you know, one of the most promising developments in contemporary Iraq, and it's not too promising, right? It has, it, ha it has its strong points, and you say, okay, so what does it say about Kurds? Nothing, it doesn't say anything about Kurds. What does it say about what do you do when there is, what happens if there is a sectarian uh, act, a sectarian violence in the area under, these, under this malicious control? How will they adjudicate it uh, in a way that doesn't exacerbate sectarianism? Well, that, it hasn't happened yet, and there's nothing in their approach that suggests they'll be more elastic or or more uh, inclusive, humane, and, and civic-minded. Uh, th th this has been rolled out as a model for Iraq, right? The idea of Sadr is that I if he succeeds within his coalition, that he can be the blueprint for uh, a renaissance of, of nationalism that makes room for Shia, Christian, Sunni, non-religious, secular leftist. Uh, and what's interesting about it from my vantage point is that of course it doesn't hold up because like all stories, it's just a story. You just assert it. And if you assert it with enough force behind it, it becomes, it sticks, right? So any more than nationalism makes sense when you think about it. You read Benedict Anderson, you study the unfolding of nationalism, you make up Italian, it's a th we're, we're Italy. And then 20 years later, that's reality. Uh, and his real life supposition in Iraq today is that if we just say being Iraqi means this thing that we're going to just say it means, that can actually become a reality and be the way that we get past the, the violence and, 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 and division and identity uh, fractures of the last 20 or 40 or 60 years, depending on, on how you slice history. Uh, I'd like to take a couple of audience questions. I think we're supposed to wrap in five minutes, but I'd say we can wrap in 15. Uh, if we get a batch of questions, maybe three or four questions a, a, a in a row, and then we'll ask them, uh, and then we'll answer them. Um, okay, let's start with you and you, and then you. And, and, and by the way, if you can make it a question, I'm sure you were about to. Um, yeah, great. <laughs> Um, the um, one American import which everybody seems to like is the New York State Chartered Colleges and Universities. And I'm wondering about, it, it seems to be the most positive thing, how, how that plays out 
in this. And then per your wrap-up thing, related to that is the outside world's looking at us as America is really an idea. It doesn't have, you know, the blood and earth kind of thing, though obviously there's plenty of blood and earth here in our history. Um, so how does this positive thread or threads from us work? Great question, thank you. you sir? Um, thank you. My question is to Professor Salin and then to the panel. Um, you noted how um, the young generation of Iraqi Kurdistan feels itself free of the uh, military threats from the central government. And yet just about a year ago, at this time I think it was, um, the Kurdish forces had to stand down. I mean, it, it was pretty, pretty much without much shooting, I understand, but they were militarily defeated. Uh, so it seems to me that you're saying, perhaps your comment would also share the comment, that you're saying that it's possible to have some uh, authoritarianism, you know, without the threat of being chemically gassed, you know, as, as their parents were under, but there would still be some freedom that is acceptable enough without having a state. They say, you know, we're, we don't want to stay, and yet they're willing to live under, you know, conditions that we as Americans would never dream being under, you know, such military threat from our neighbors. And uh, you finished? Okay, and, and ma'am in the back? Me? Or? No, no. Me? Was it you, Tala? Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, so this is for anyone. I'd be interested to know um, if and how you look at language in your lens of um, citizenship and identity politics um, and the balance involved in using language to create a more united um, national identity, but while still also maintaining um, the smaller identities of language groups, um, specifically because I like Melanie's example of Brittany and France, how they have a very strong um, regional identity and they also have their own language, but um, their language has kind of uh, been on the verge of dying out um, since they've been kind of brought more into a national French identity, I guess. Um, more so than they have in the past. I don't know all the details on that, but um, but I'd be interested to know if you know what other examples there might be out there. Um, yeah. Thanks. Go ahead, you as well. Um, I was wondering if you could speak to what difference the level of particularism of the refugees and other immigrants coming from the Middle East to the United States and other Western countries will have on their. Um, do you want to just go this way start with you michael and take uh, whatever piece of it you want sure well uh, in terms of um america and america as an idea um it, it's kind of had uh, better days in terms Ooh. of its public messaging so um <laughs> You know, I'm surprised. And yet people keep coming. Yeah, I'm surprised at the resilience, but but obviously... It's still better than Assad Syria, maybe. <laughs> it is. Um, but uh, certainly, I mean, American soft powers has been diminished. Um, I think it's still something that we can aspire to without being um, overly preachy and judgmental, uh, because there is that kind of hectoring uh, that often goes along with it. Um, but... All that being said, you know, Guantanamo Bay, torture, Iraq war, uh, Donald Trump, uh, it's, it's not a great narrative to tell of late. So um, I think there are, it's, it's something we, um, that's, that's quite important in terms of how we deal in the region. Uh, it's difficult to lecture Egyptians about religious freedom, um, which um, happens. Uh, and I'd like, I'd like the United States to have something to say about those issues. Um, but it's difficult to be doing that uh, while a presidential candidate says he wants to ban all Muslim Muslims from coming into the country. So, um, you know, the hypocrisy has real costs in terms of our ability to be um, taken seriously. Uh, I don't remember what else there was. That's but, be a, Carly, why don't you take the question about the, the... Sure. 
Um, so thanks for the question. Absolutely, there was this uh, this case after the independence referendum in Iraqi Kurdistan where the Iraqi army came back in, um, and which was for some people evocative of what happened uh, in, in various times under Saddam. But I would say it wasn't, it's not the same thing. I mean, the post-2003 generation has grown up in an Iraqi Kurdistan that's largely autonomous, where they were educated in Kurdish, where they weren't, um, I mean, there was no threat of, of genocide and ethnic cleansing and the kinds of things that happened under Saddam. So it's a very different degree. I think what happened in Kirkuk and in the disputed territories that you're referring to actually, in the end, benefited the establishment parties in Iraqi Kurdistan, because again, it, it empowers this Peshmerga generation. It empowers the crop of leaders who had established themselves as military leaders first and then made that transition from being warriors into being politicians. And it delegitimizes the younger generation even more because when there's an external security threat, these young Kurds who never participated in that armed struggle have no legitimacy, essentially. So I think I think that's what happened. And, and one thing I would say is that- Why does it, it delegitimize them? It's it actually, I mean, it, it, it seems that the older generation may be correct. Well, I think, again, I mean, I do think the degrees are quite different. And if we look at post-2003, probably more young Iraqi Kurds have faced repression from the, part, the Kurdish parties themselves than from Baghdad. I mean, for instance, there was, a, there was a protest movement in 2011 that had a very forceful security crackdown coordinated by the Kurdish parties themselves. But for young Kurds, it creates a contradiction. It creates a conflict. Because on the one hand, they do buy into the logic of the, the Kurdish nationalist narrative that was founded on this idea of resistance against Baghdad, but on the other hand, that's not their lived experience. So it creates a very profound contradiction, and I think um, just briefly, one thing that we found in our field work is that we did interviews before the independence referendum, and every single Kurd we interviewed told us, that young Kurd that we interviewed told us they would vote no in the independence referendum, and then we did interviews after the independence referendum, and almost all of them told us they voted yes. So there is this conflict, um, it, it's, I, and we couldn't find, the, the most young Kurds were not able to articulate how they reconciled these two, but it's a form of double think in a way, where they, they can't resist the nationalist cries of the parties because they've grown up on that nationalist narrative, but at the same time, they know that it doesn't serve them. And, and it's interesting as a, you know, to talk about the, the failures of narrative. So uh, on the one hand, fascinating that when this referendum took place, Iran and the United States both told the Kurds, don't do this, it's an, it, we won't support it, it's a terrible idea, if you do it, we'll cut you loose. The Kurds did it anyway, and then when, you know, would there be war, would there be bloodshed? Well, no, it was negotiated peacefully, and interestingly, it was Kurds on one side coordinating with Baghdad and the Iranians against Kurds on the other side who were more gung-ho to de-escalate this crisis around Kirkuk, which, helpfully explodes the uh, you know determinism you know Kurds will always do this Arabs will always do this no pe people are political actors and their identities are malleable and they behave in different malleable useful ways so that was that was great on the other hand it's to this day the these Kurdish leaders so, some of whom I think are incredibly you know courageous and insightful whatever have nothing uh, uh, useful to say about how that referendum played out. And I've spoken to some of them in private and been shocked by the, by the cavalier and, and inane way in which they'll say, to this day, well, you know, when it came down to it, I couldn't speak up against this and I personally did vote for it. And yes, it screwed the national aspirations of my people and created a crisis in which we lost on every possible score. But going back and looking at it, I would do the same again. And that talk about failures of narrative. That's like, you know, okay, we can make mistakes, but if we don't learn from our mistakes, we're likely to repeat the same pathologies. And that's that's where one looks at Iraq or, God forbid, Lebanon, and you see this stuck and stuck and stuck on these on these cyclical repetitions of the same mistakes. And that's where where it's hard to think about you know, how is universal rights or some something better, even something worse but different, going to come in and uh, and replace these dynamics. Melanie, do you want to speak to the question about language groups? Sure. Yeah. Or, I, or I, about the AUBs or both? Yeah. I, I know you both are going to have stuff to say about the American universities. About those, but I want to say something really quick about a comment you made earlier about Muqtada Sadr aligning with the leftist national 
differentials. And just to draw further out the lessons of what you said in answer to one of your prior questions, which is he found it in his political interest to make that alliance, which is one answer to your question of when you get a sort of civic nationalist narrative from the top down. It's when a politician finds it in their political interest. It may not be coming out of pure sort of noble pursuits of, you know, uh, deeply held values of egalitarianism and whatnot, but I mean, very few people I think are pure. It's when they find it politically expedient to do things. So, so I just wanted to say that quick point. Uh, to the point about accredited U.S. universities, I recently read this fantastic article in Perspectives on Politics, which is one of the journals of the American Political Science Association by a political scientist at University of Maryland. I think her name is Calvert Jones. And it's an ethnography in the Emirates of why is it basically the research question was why did these authoritarian rulers want to import these Western liberal institutions and extol the virtues of Western liberal uh, thinking and so forth, but but want to stop at the at the political ramifications of that? And so it's a really fascinating piece based on her ethnographic observations of these nostalgic feelings these Gulf rulers have for studying abroad in the West, and they've embodied some of the lessons and that they perceive of their experiences there of sort of hard work and individual effort, but then it stops at other uh, implications. And so, what's that? Does it include this one with the full-fledged campus? <laughs> I think there, there's no campus mentioned explicitly. <laughs> so uh, so that's, that's just one thing. I think it's worth reading. It's really interesting. And then on the language, so I don't, I mean, I just threw out the Breton example. Obviously, they, you know, there, there was a French, a very strong French national identity, and the people from Brittany are not threatening to succeed or, any, succeed or anything. But there's been interesting research on how these different regional identities became over centuries integrated into this national uh, piece while still retaining elements of... Um, but I do want to say one quick thing about language. It's not language in the sense that you mean it, uh, but it's language in the sense of using sectarian hate speech and what it can do to inflame um, people's sense of threat and therefore greater attachment to um, sectarian identity. So I think there's some evidence of this. On the other hand, um, just as a quick punchline, I ran last year a survey in Lebanon in which we had this experimental component and we were showing them different profiles of uh, politicians saying different things. And people in this nationally representative survey of Lebanon really pushed back against the politicians who were using sectarian antagonistic language. They wanted, they preferred politicians who made sort of nationally inclusive statements, which I thought was really interesting um, in this, you know, particular historical moment. So, so they were, you know, that I think that's a sort of positive moment here that uh, there was sort of shared commitment to this national uh, well-being. Elizabeth, did you want to talk about the universities? Or, uh, the university, or any two, two, two quick points. On the universities, I'll just say this from a historical point of view. A hundred years ago, they were the one place where you had experts who understood the, you know, because you know, they were American, the few Americans who were over there. Uh, but they were also tied into progressive foreign policy circles that existed at the time of Woodrow Wilson and the progressive era and so on. And I think uh, telescoping back up to the present moment, uh, how do those of, uh, you know, we ask, well, what can we do or what is our role? In part, it's a very negative role. We don't have, a, we're not playing an ideal example right now um, to the world, uh, except insofar as our own people are fighting for very similar rights against similar problems. There's an opportunity to go back to that moment 100 years ago where progressives were able to say, we are fighting the same fights you are. We are not approaching you as somehow coming from a superior place with a lesson already learned, right? But we are working through. One of my favorite things, and I won't go into it too much, is to compare the problem of moving toward uh, equality and universal citizenship in, in the Middle East to the problems we had with race in this country produced a bloody civil war, 
you know, and the move from slavery and trying to disestablish a privileged white elite, right? Um, why would we expect any less given the same problems in the Middle East, right? So that's one point, okay? A second point, though, um, here is the, uh, where is it in our foreign policy speak right now where seriously people are saying, oh, right, you know, since the Cold War, we have been building up the power of Gulf monarchies who now throw around a lot of money in the region, right? Maybe if, you know, part of the conversation of the Green New Deal would be, you know, getting off the oil thing and, and pulling back, you know, that is our, I see as Americans, better role at this moment, right, is to disempower those forces in the region that we prop up who represent some of the biggest obstacles to the last point. Can I make one quick, very quick one? Quick one. You neglected been, to say in your, in your comment about Samara, right, uh -huh. your, your thing, the people who got together in 1920, who had, came from very different points of view and had their little sectarian fiefdoms to protect, came together because there was a greater external threat. There is no doubt that if they weren't fighting, uh, you know, the same threat of colonization from Europe, that they would not have gotten into that room and argued out and compromised, right? And the threat uh, of ISIS. What you're looking for in Samara is, okay, is the threat from Iran? Is no, the, the threat, threat from, from ISIS. It was from ISIS, but there's a continuing threat from Iran, and I'm interested in what you think about Muqtada Sadr and, uh, you know, a motive to build bridges. You know, there's an old Iraqist politics that the Communist Party represents in Iraq, Iraq right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, in the degree which it is in his self-interest to build these coalitions, and, to build, and it, only through there can you build a strong state that is built through compromises and, you know, an agreement on rights. Otherwise, you do get the military state that uh, everyone fears. I think but that's, a, that's a good point, and you're right. I didn't, um, I, I neglected to talk about that, and I think that, that actually some of the most interesting things that happened in Iraq in the last five years were because of the existential threat from ISIS, and as that recedes from the immediate consciousness and the, 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 the sense of do or die crisis fades, some of these experiments are going to lose their momentum as well. Mm -hmm. uh, now, Muqtada and others in Iraq are, 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 I mean, they realize that the crisis is only around the corner. It hasn't actually been resolved. Um, and so part of the political struggle is to keep that sense of urgency. But as Kale showed and, and lots of other work shows as well, uh, you know, these are corrupt, conservative, not admirable leaders. Um, and they have so much usually financial interest to gain from, from the misrule of their states that as soon as uh, they're not about to be wiped out, they have no interest in drumming up grassroots support from the youth because the next thing that happens is they're going to be unseated as leaders of their own parties. Um, so, uh, Nadim, I know you had a question, but we're going to go to this reception afterwards. And I've been given the 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 the, <laughs> uh, the 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 cutoff signal from from my colleagues. Um, I just wanted, in closing, to say uh, one of the big motivators of this project was uh, pushing back against what I think a lot of us feel is this false idea that universalism and rights are a Western idea that has been artificially uh, exported to the world, including to the Middle East, where it doesn't fit. Um, and there is this really un unhelpful confluence of, of interest between ra anti-Muslim racists in the West and Muslim essentialists in the MENA region, who both will argue for different reasons, and I think equally inaccurately, that, you know, Islam says that people will be X, and there's an essentialist set of, of, of practices that come from people being in this religion, and therefore, whatever political outcome you're pushing for, and I think we know empirically, and, and from, from lots and lots of observations now and in history that all kinds of people espouse all kinds of political beliefs and systems and that ever has been so in the Middle East and everywhere else. Uh, rights, secularism, universalism, minoritarianism, like the bad ideas, the good ideas, all have authentic, vibrant constituencies all over the world. Um, there are Arabs and non-Arabs in the Middle East, uh, Muslims and non-Muslims, and so on and so forth, who've taken all these positions. Uh, and one of the anomalies of the recent historical moment is this appearance of a monolithic approach 
to the question of rights in the Middle East. So there's this, if you're, if you're ahistorical, you'd look at the Middle East and say, well, no one in the Middle East, except for, you know, 20 Western educated people who don't matter, even talks about these ideas. Well, that's just not true. And it hasn't been true. Uh, people have talked about all these ideas in that region and in this region. Uh, and, and as we have a moment now in the West where some really toxic ideas have found expression in powerful places and with real popular constituencies, we're suddenly open again to saying, well, wait, 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 you know, just because some people say these terrible things doesn't mean there are universal view. Um, and I think that opens up um, possibilities the other way around to say, okay, let's stop being, you know, t t adopting the idea that there's one single essentialist narrative that explains what the West is or what the East is or what the Arab world is, or even let's maybe stop talking about it as the Arab world and, and, and use other words uh, that are that leave more room for the political possibilities uh, that uh, do exist. And, and we do identify a lot of possibilities. They're not only bleak ones. There's not only nihilistic, exclusivist, essentialist narratives at play. There are also a lot of reformist and interesting and transformational narratives at play and political experiments underway. Uh, so as, uh, uh, as I urge you to think about that as you walk across the hall to uh, sample our fine hors d'oeuvres um, and to thank our hosts uh, and, and the people who have supported this research. Uh, and we hope this is the beginning uh, of a long conversation about how to extend universal rights in MENA and in the world.